Greetings to all of our friends of Amazing Discoveries. Thank you for tuning in. We pray that today's message of health will be of vital interest to you. Our topic is going to be called Appetite Wars. And I think I could safely say that every one of us as a human being fights some issue with appetite. So may this be of help and benefit to you as we look at why the appetite wars are so big. Before we get started, let's bow for a word of prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, as we open up this issue of appetite, we know that there's many struggles in our lives. We've made many commitments, and they're like ropes of sand. They just fall apart. So we're wanting help from heaven. I pray that you will be with me. Give me words that will be of benefit to every listener. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the key things to understand as we get started looking at appetite is that the food industry that's supplying our food for us have an agenda. And to understand how the food industry works, I want to look at a quote or uh, some principles that we learned from Marian Nessel. She wrote a book called Food Politics. Marian Nessel has been a nutrition policy advisor for the Department of Health and Human Resources. She's also worked for the FDA and the USDA in the United States. And in her book, she describes how the food industry works. She says there's key principles. And as we look at this slide, we see that one of the first things that they look at and they address is taste. And of course, if something doesn't taste good, you're not going to buy their product. The second thing is cost. Everybody's trying to save money. And so the cheaper they can make a product, the more likely you will be to buy their product. The next thing is convenience. I see this has really become an important issue in our world as there are two people in the family, mom and dad, that are at work. Maybe 50 years ago when it wasn't so common that the woman was um, not in the workforce and she was home, she was doing the cooking, the shopping, taking care of the kids. But in today's society, with mom out of the home and working, she doesn't have time to cook and to clean like she did before. And in general, I think I could safely say that many women and even men in general don't even know how to cook their own food. And so we have moved from home cooked meals from scratch to buying packages. You can buy meals that are packaged. So convenience is a way that they get you to buy their food. And the last one I find very interesting. She says that one of the food industry's tactics is public confusion. Now, what does that mean? What that means is having different voices giving conflicting information. So if you have someone out there, you have research that says drinking milk is harmful for your heart, but then you have another set of information from scientists, from researchers, from people that we trust that says, oh, you need to drink milk. It'll build strong bones. It'll make a healthy heart. So there's confusion there. And as a public um, listener, as you watch these things on the nightly news or you read them in health magazines, you're going to say, well, who's speaking the truth? They're all scientists. They have been trained. They've gone to school for 20-some years. Who can I trust? So public confusion helps to have people buy their food because when, um, when your mind becomes in confusion over a subject, what you tend to do is just throw out the whole thing and say, I don't care what science says, I'm going to buy what tastes good. So one of their big um, tactics that they do is public confusion. As I mentioned, 
I believe every one of us struggle with appetite. And when Christ came to this earth to accomplish his sacrifice for our redemption, he had to begin the work just where the rune began, and that is upon the point of appetite. There's a compilation book. It's called Councils on Diets and Foods. It's a wonderful book filled with principles of good health that was written over a hundred years ago. And the writings in that book were bringing out points of health that have today been scientifically proven. So in this book, it says that intemperance lies at the foundation of all the moral issue, evils known to man. What lies at the foundation? It's intemperance. And what is intemperance? It's basically doing whatever tastes good to you, whatever feels good. It's not, it's not having self-control. In redemption, the denial of appetite was the first work of Christ. So let me ask you this question. Is there really a link between cookies, between cognition, your thinking, and is there a link with conversion? Do all these three things have anything to do with your eternal destiny? What you eat or how you think and where you end up in eternity. Our diet has everything to do with our destiny. In a periodical in the 1800s, we find this statement, there are but few who as yet are aroused sufficiently to understand how much their habits of diet have to do with their health, their character, their usefulness in this life, and their eternal destiny. So our habits of eating affect these four major areas of our life, our health, our character, our usefulness, and eventually where we spend our eternity. So each one of us are on a journey. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, our destiny going to be victory? Or is it going to be defeat? Something to help you decide this is a list of questions that I have. Ask yourself, what do I want? What do I really want in life? And is this substance that I think is so good, is it really what I need? Another question is, is this from God? Is this something that God would give to me? How about, have you counted the cost? Everything comes with the cost. So the next question is, is it worth it? I had a woman that I treated one time, and she had a problem with weight. She was quite overweight, over several hundred pounds. And as she was going through the struggles to change her dietary habits and to um, give up a, a large number of foods that she had been used to eating. She came to me and she said, you know, I've been asking myself two questions. The first one was, is this how I want to die? She started thinking about what would happen if she passed away. And they had to come and get her from her home to bring her to the mortuary. She said they wouldn't even be able to get me out the door. She was so big. And then she said, if this isn't how I want to die, is it how I want to live? And so I want you to remember these questions, and perhaps they will help you as you are struggling in these appetite wars. The appetite war is a power over every one of us. Here's a statement that I want to read to you that is coming true in our world today. It says, the controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands when if they had conquered on this point, this point of appetite, they would have moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. 
It goes on to say, but those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. The continual transgression of man for 6,000 years has brought sickness, pain, and death as its fruits. And as we near the close of time, I want you to pay attention to this last sentence. As we near the close of time, Satan's temptation to indulge appetite will be more powerful and more difficult to overcome. What I want to show you today is why this is coming true. How he has gained the victory over people in a more powerful way as we have advanced in time to the close of history. Let's look at first the difference between hunger and appetite. Hunger is described as the need for food. That need is triggered, the hunger is triggered because of chemical changes that happen in your body. As your blood sugar goes down, a message is given from certain hormones that goes up to your brain and says, you better eat, get me a source of glucose. Now appetite, on the other hand, does not come from that need. It is just simply a feeling of craving or a desire for something specific. It's not that you need food, it's just that, oh, this sounds really good. Ah, this is what I want to eat. And it's for eating for reasons other than anything that's sufficient for nutrition. And it involves your sensory perceptions, psychological desires. It looks good, it smells good, I want to eat it. So those are the difference between hunger and appetite. You can ask yourself this question to determine why you're eating, if it's for hunger or for appetite. So if you say, well, why, why do people need to eat? I've asked this to a lot of people. And you know, for hunger, there's really one basic reason, and that's for nutrition and health, because our body is made out of the substance that we get out of the food supply. And we need energy. And the energy that we get from our nutrition should give us strength and endurance. So basically, am I eating to satisfy the needs of my body? But when we look at the appetite side, it's quite different. Appetite has to do with cravings. It's a physical addiction to a certain food. Have you ever had this craving, I've got to have broccoli or I'm going to kill somebody? You know, you never have that problem. Healthy food that's not loaded with substances that are addictive never cause these cravings. Now, it's not that you might not enjoy something good, like, oh, I really feel like eating a good salad. It's not that type. It's more that I've got to have it or I'm not going to be able to continue my life today, you know, to keep going. I've got to have this product. The other thing with what we eat that only satisfies it satisfies an energy need, but there's a difference. It leads to weakness and no endurance. For example, you've got a busy day and you rush out of the house. You don't have time really for breakfast, but you, you have, you're somewhat healthy, so you get a granola bar and you chomp that down. Well, there's probably, oh, let's, let's just be conservative and say there's eight teaspoons of sugar in that granola bar even though we think of it being healthy. Lots of sugar, little fiber. About two hours later, you're at work and all of a sudden your energy starts diving. And what do you have to do? You've got to go to the break room, get your cup of coffee and a donut, and you're good to go for another two hours. So you really don't gain the energy that you need for strength and endurance. That's the difference with what happens when you satisfy your true nutritional needs. I've had people tell me, oh, we eat for the experience. In fact, we travel around the world and where we go to France, we know just the restaurant that we want to eat at. So we are going because we want to experience the taste of a different food. And if a new restaurant opens up in town, we want to go because we want to experience what that new food tastes like. The next um, 
thing that people have told me, this is a big one. They eat for comfort. Are you a comfort eater? A lot of people find comfort when they're hurting, emotional pain particularly, and they just get their bag of cookies, their bowl of ice cream, whatever it is that they find, and they comfort their hurt feelings with their food. Now the next category is the social. And I used to think, well, you know, social could satisfy hunger issues too. Well, it's a good thing to eat socially. It's enjoyable to share even good food with other people. But in this setting, what I'm talking about in separating hunger from appetite is when you're doing it socially just because you're all um, going to be indulging. And it's not that there's carefulness in what you're eating. So for survival, hunger does not necessarily have to be by, by it, with other people. You can eat by yourself and satisfy your needs. So the appetite is really satisfying your wants and not your needs. What you want to ask yourself is, why do I need to eat? Why do you need to eat? The answer is very simple. It's because food is the building blocks of our body. It's what gives us fuel. It's what gives us good energy. But it's not just for the support of the body. Really, this body is just a vehicle to carry our brain. So what we eat is to build a strong, healthy body so that we have strong, healthy minds. And we all know that without our minds, we can't grow, we can't think, we can't learn. So we want healthy brains. So when we eat, we should really be thinking, what is going to give me the strongest mental ability, the strongest brain that I can build? And why is the brain so important? Why is it that we need to think? The most important reason is because our brain is the only communication that God has with us. It is through our brain that we receive the communication from God and then be able to make a decision of whether we want to serve Him or not. So I think it's extremely important that we choose foods that keep our brain healthy because we want to be able to hear the word that God has for us. Well, let's look at how the brain works and where the hunger center is. There's a, some complicated processes that go on that make you sense hunger. But basically, the hunger message is received in the hypothalamus. It comes from a hormone that is produced in the stomach mostly. It's produced in other places, but the main place that it's produced is in the stomach, and it's called ghrelin. This is a hormone that as your stomach has emptied from a previous meal, as it starts to shrink, the cells that produce ghrelin are given a, a trigger to produce this ghrelin. It goes into the bloodstream, goes up to your hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus then sends a message to, the, to your body that you're hungry. The leptin is another hormone that when you start to um, eat and you start to fill your stomach with food, those as the stomach stretches out and as insulin is produced and fat cells begin to receive nutrients, the message from leptin is, okay, I've had enough. I'm satisfied. The hypothalamus is responsible for triggering hunger and for telling you, okay, you need to stop eating. So the control center of hunger is in the hypothalamus. However, hunger is not to be controlled by the hypothalamus because remember that the hypothalamus is part of the limbic system. And if you operate just by the limbic system, you're not going to have good discretion in what you choose to satisfy your hunger. So hunger needs to be controlled by good judgment, by making a reasonable choice, intellectual decision. And even spirituality and morality plays a part. And of course, the will, your final decision, is what needs to control your hunger. 
And where is that located? It is in the frontal lobe. That is what makes a better decision. Think of it this way. You're hungry. And it, if you go just by your limbic system, you might just grab a Snickers candy bar to eat. But if you go, go by intellectual facts and you know what's more nutritious, you may choose an apple instead of the Snickers. So it needs to be your judgment based on information that you've taken in of what feeds our body the best. On the other hand, the appetite center is strictly in the limbic system. So as I mentioned, the hypothalamus that gives us the trigger for hunger, that's the limbic system where our desires and the dopamine rush takes place. And the nucleus accumbens is in this process. So what it's really about is a tension between your consciousness and your subconscious. We talked about this in another talk on the physiology of, of addiction and in the physiology of victory, where the consciousness is your frontal lobe and your subconscious is your limbic system. So as a reminder, in case you hadn't seen those other talks, Let's just do a brief summary of what the subconscious works on. These are some of the key facts. The subconscious does not judge what you tell it. It takes everything as a fact. It cannot tell the difference between what's true and what's false. It takes everything as literal, and it never says no. So if you are a marketer and you're in the food industry, are you going to want to target the consciousness where you are more aware of the decisions you make and you might make decisions because of the information you've, you've gained that it's better to eat a salad instead of eating some junk food, some fast food? Or do you want to go to a center where the choice is going to be based on something that never says no? If you can put enough influence on that subconscious it won't say no. So what do market marketers target? They're going to target your appetite. They're going to go for your subconscious. This is why the food industry, every one of them, will hire it, um, advertisers that are very keen on knowing how to target the subconscious because they will spend millions of dollars to produce a 30 or 60 second commercial because it will go to your subconscious. You know, the, the songs that are played um, will stick in your mind because it's going to the subconscious. And during a commercial, there's these quick um, pictures that are flashed in, and your consciousness may not even pick it up. It might be a commercial for some laundry detergent. And you go to the store and you're needing to shop and, and buy laundry detergent. And you really don't know what you want to get. But because of a commercial you watched, it's going to influence your thinking saying, you know, this one gets my clothes whiter. I think this is what I'm going to get. And you put it in your cart. Here's a picture of an example of a food industry target. This came like from a flyer in the mail, in the, the, those um, free newspapers. It says, caution, new addictive flavors ahead. They even tell you it's addictive flavors. And they say, you've been warned. And the um, restaurant that was putting out this um, advertisement is called Smoky Bones Bar and Fire Grill. They just right out tell you but it draws you in. So those are the types of things that they target. Why would Satan want to appeal to your appetite? The reason is, is because through your appetite, Satan can gain control of the mind and the whole being. And so that is why everything goes into focusing on your appetite center. How successful 
have marketers been in getting you to buy their product? Here's how you can measure it. Let's look at the salary of a few of our top industries, our food industries. On the top here, we have Coca-Cola. The CEO of Coca-Cola in 2008 made over $22 million. Pepsi-Cola was quite a bit lower. It was almost $15 million. The Nabisco CEO made over $41 million in 2008. Now, Budweiser, this kind of surprised me. He's, he, that CEO was down on the lower li limits. He was 14 million, this was 2007. But an interesting statistic with this is that $1.6 billion in sales from Budweiser was to underaged youth. They're making a lot of money on our children. They're pulling them in as well. Well, let's move on, McDonald's CEO, made $17.5 million, and Starbucks CEO made $22 million. I think that's pretty good success, wouldn't you say? They are targeting you, and they're being successful at getting your money. What I call it is the four monsters. These four categories are the ones that are out to change your brain. And what are they? They're the munchies, the media, music, and medicine. These four categories are targeting your subconscious, your appetite center. Now you might ask me, medicine? I'm talking about drugs that are going to affect your brain. Drugs is the, the pharmaceutical industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, even greater than that, and it is affecting your brain. So, what is the food industry's goal? Their goal is not your health. Their goal is to keep you eating their product because they want to build their bank account and not your health. How are they accomplishing this? If we look at this picture here, we see that the main thing that people are eating today are loaded with substances that cause addiction and break down the health. They're getting MSG and pesticides and high cholesterol um, type food, all kinds of additives. And these are changing our brain as well as our body. Let me give you a couple examples of how this is working. This was an interesting story here. Paul Stitt was a biochemist, and his goal as a young person was to solve the world's hunger problem. He thought, surely there's a way to create a substance that is cheap and that will supply the nutritive needs of every person in the world. There's no reason that we can't do that. So he went into biochemistry. His book, Fighting the Food Giants, it's on our slide here. You can um, find it, the full book on the internet. But in that book, he tells the story of one of his first jobs in the food industry was with Quaker Oats. He and a colleague decided that instead of reinventing the wheel, that they would go through the files of past um, studies that have been done and see what their company had already accomplished. They came across a research on puffed wheat. When puffed wheat was first discovered, that was back in the day where they did more testing on toxicity than they do today. What they did to determine how beneficial or unbeneficial the food would be is they took four groups of rats. The first group they fed nothing but whole grains, and they gave them some vitamins and minerals as well. The second group of rats were given chemical nutrients that was determined was, were the, the needs of the rats. The third group was given white sugar, nothing but white sugar. And the fourth group was given puffed wheat. And all of the, the four groups had water sufficient. Now, as you look at this, if you look at group number one, it's whole grains. 
And if you look at puffed wheat, and you, if you, you take a, a box, a cereal box of puffed wheats, and you look on the ingredients, what you're going to find is 100% whole wheat. There's nothing else added. There's no salt. There's no additives. It's pure 100% whole wheat. So what they did was see how long these rats lived. The group in the first um, category with whole grains lived greater than one year. The second group that was fed chemical nutrients that was targeted and measured out just for a rat's particular needs, they lived two months. Now the rats that were fed white sugar, totally no nutritional value. Plenty of glucose, but no nutritional value. They lived one month. So if you look at these values, you say, hmm, what do you think the group that ate puffed wheat, how long do you think they lived? The results were surprising. Those who ate puffed wheat only survived two weeks. 50% that of those that were fed a pure sugar diet. The scientists concluded from this study that not only was, nutri was, not only was puffed wheat nutritionally deficient, but something in it had become toxic because nutritionally deficient rats on white sugar lived a month, but these rats lived two weeks, half the time as the others. What they do when they puff a cereal, a grain, is it is put under 1,500 pounds of pressure, and that tremendous amount of pressure changes the chemical structure of the grain. And in some way, whether it's breaking proteins and changing all the other structures in it, not only destroy its nutritional value, but it becomes toxic to the body. So Paul Stitt and his colleague took the re this research file down to the president of the company and said, look at what we have found on Quaker, on our puffed wheat from Quaker Oats. And they showed it to him and he looked at it and he said, what do I care? This product made over $9 million for my company last year. And I don't care whether people put it in their mouth or if they throw it on brides when they are in a wedding. He said, I want you to leave my office, get rid of this information, and I never want to hear about it again. Well, that's about the last you will hear about it, except for what happened. Paul Stitt eventually left the food industry. He married a woman, Barbara Reed, who was a juvenile probation officer who did a lot of work and is still to this day, does a lot of work with juveniles and um, nutrition for young people. And together they started a food company of whole grains in Wisconsin. So under this um, facility that he got going, he reproduced this study and had the exact same results. Well, let me give you another example. Let's look at Oreo cookies. I don't know about you, but they were one of my favorite. I loved Oreo cookies. Well, Nabisco Company spends millions of dollars on their formulation so that you have to keep coming back. Can you eat just one cookie? How do they do it? How do they keep you coming back? Well, the first thing I want to tell you is that any time a food that you're eating reaches close to the fat and sugar composition of being about 50-50, about 50% 50 fat and 50% sugar, you are going to trigger the pleasure center and the dopamine rush, the addictive cycle that we've been talking about in previous um, lectures is triggered. And so you're going to want to go back and eat more. The other thing that has an effect on the brain is that there's 11 artificial colorings and artificial colorings have another effect on the brain 
that cause you to enter into this addictive cycle. But here was what really surprised me. In their recipe, they have 23 appetite stimulants. Now, I don't know about you, but when I heard that, I thought, whoa, 23? I would say that five would be more than sufficient. So when you're in the grocery store and you see moms pushing their cart and little kids in the, in the um, basket with them and they're leaning over and they're reaching out for this product and for that product and they're crying out, the reason is, is because they've become addicted to these substances and part of the reason is these appetite stimulants. So when you're struggling with weight issues, health issues, sugar, um, addictions, whatever it might be, I want you to realize that it's more than a fact that you just don't have self-control. Part of it is because you are taking in substances that are changing your self-control. And what I want you to realize today is that you must take control and start realizing what's targeting your appetite. It used to be about 30 years ago when I first started teaching about nutrition one of the key things that we would teach people is to read your labels. Read your labels, read your labels, read your labels. If you can't pronounce the ingredients in it, you probably shouldn't eat it. Well, after I've learned some of these things, like this Oreo cookies or about puffed wheat, you know, you're not going to see any of this information on your label. So it's not a matter of reading your label. I have had to say that I've come to a place where I will tell my clients, my patients, if it has a label, you probably better not eat it. Now, I don't want to carry that too far because there are things that are in packages. But the thing that I am trying to emphasize is if man manipulates a substance, it's most likely going to have some problems with it that you don't want in your body. I'm going to give you a few other examples of things that are added into foods. Have you heard of excitotoxins? If you haven't, there's, there's a lot of research out there, and I want to invite you to look on the Amazing Discoveries library um, list, and they have documentaries and lectures on excitotoxins. So we're not going to go into them today, but some of the big ones are monosodium glutamate, MSG. Glutamic acid, so it might not just be MSG, but it can come in the form of glutamic acid. Aspartame and cysteine, these are excitotoxins that impact the way the brain functions and override your control center. In fact, they have found that excitotoxins are addictive. A book that is used in college classes for nutrition, it's called Contemporary Nutrition, they claim that the food additive industry readily admits that MSG has addictive properties and can cause people to gain weight. I, if you look up excitotoxins, whether you look online or you get some of the other documentaries on them, what you need to do is find how MSG is labeled in their food products because they don't always say MSG. It can be hidden. They have dozens of other names where they hide it. It could be spices. It could be natural flavors. Um, hydrolyzed yeast protein. These type of things become a, a problem as far as our appetite control center. Another thing about excitotoxins is that they make you think that food is nutritious and tastier. It opens up your taste buds so that you have a um, greater taste experience. And so food that is really of lower quality tastes better. It stimulates insulin production, and in that stimulation of insulin, you get an appetite stimulant. So it's going to make you want more food than what you really need to eat. MSG has an effect on leptin. Typically, when you take in food and you get an insulin response and the food is transported into your cells and particularly into your fat cells, 
the leptin that tells you you're satisfied and you don't need to eat anymore, it will send the message to the hypothalamus and you'll stop eating. But MSG has an effect on that process. They have found that MSG intake was related to the prevalence of overweight in today's society. How that works is because it destroys the neurons in the hypothalamus by MSG that attenuate the actions of leptin. In fact, MSG at concentrations just slightly surpassing those found in everyday food has potential for damaging the hypothalamus regulating appetite center, regulation of appetite. So this is something that we need to be very careful is not in our food. Now besides the chemicals that we have, one of the most addictive substances that the food industry uses is something that every one of us experiences probably every day. We love it because it makes us feel so good. It's called sugar. In fact, let's look at the increase of sugar over time. Back in the 1700s, the average person ate four pounds of sugar a year. A hundred years later, it increased to 18 pounds per year. Well, the, what happened here is in the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution came in and we learned how to manufacture more sugar. So by the 1900s, we are receiving 90 pounds of sugar a year. But the sad story is that by the 2000s, the average person is consuming half a pound a day. Some of you may be getting less, but that just means somebody else is getting more. So what does sugar have to do with our health? There's some interesting science that came out. This was an experiment that was done in Australia in 2008. And the research found that genes are impacted by sugar. They found that just one dose of sugar that elevates your blood sugar level, you see on our picture on the lower, on the right hand side here, that when your blood sugar takes a high greater than normal, that that one hit will change your DNA for two weeks. And that if you continue to have an abnormally high um, blood sugar level after a sugar hit, that you potentially can damage your DNA permanently. And the other problem was that they found was that this um, blood sugar spike from refined sugars has to do with switching off genetic control systems in your brain that's designed to protect the body against diabetes and heart disease. So I found this very, very interesting. You know, people might say, well, I rarely, I rarely eat a, a snack or a treat. I might eat sugar once a week, you know, have a, have a dessert that's sugar laden. But what this is saying is that as if you continue to have sugar within a two week period, you are potentially harming your DNA that will be passed on even to your children and your children's children. Another study that was done was a test on sugar and the addictive process. And what they did was they were feeding sugar and cocaine to rats. They fed sugar to these animals for a period of time until they were addicted. And they had fed cocaine to them for a period of time until they were addicted. Then they gave them a choice between the sugar or the cocaine. And what they found is that they preferred the cocaine over, they prefer, excuse me, they preferred the sugar over the cocaine. Here's a statement of what they found. The supranormal stimulation of these receptors, that's the overabundance of stimulation from the dopamine caused by sugar, rich diets, 
such as those now widely available in modern, modern societies, would generate a supranormal reward signal in the brain with the potential to override self-control mechanisms and thus lead to addiction. So there's a lot of studies going on on sugar and what they're finding is it's a great substance to get you to keep eating their sugar. Well, there's many other things. What I wanted to do today, the purpose was to bring to your awareness that what is going on when you go into your grocery stores or the food industries, the restaurants, the fast food industries, they are building their um, business by keeping you coming back. And you may be suffering health-wise because of it. And so some of the things that I've said today may be startling. And I, and I really wanted them to be. I want you to become aware that you need to take control of your health and not let something else or someone else be manipulating your habits in life. I want to conclude today with a story. Here's a nice little picture. We have nicknamed our friend here, Albert. And Albert is a macaque monkey. And macaque monkeys are very important for research. I'm, I want to show you. I've got my coconut shell here. Now, this is a story that's been passed around. And I've read some things that indicate that it's not really true of how this, is, this happens. So the point is, is not whether it's really how they capture macaque monkeys, but the principle is what I want you to get. So what's been told is that when, re when researchers do experiments, some things are not ethically good to do on human beings because it could be toxic and it's better not to destroy a human life, but it's not quite so bad to do it to an animal. So the macaque monkeys have a physiology that's very similar to humans. And so they go to the jungles and they need to capture these animals. And so what they do is get a coconut and they cut the top of it off and so that you have a nice hollowed coconut. And then they screw it down onto a platform of some sort and they put a favorite substance that a monkey would love, or a macaque. When the animal comes up and puts his hand into the coconut and grabs that substance, what happens is when he tries to get away, because his fist is bigger than his open hand, he is stuck. And so all the um, gentlemen have to do is give them a dart of some sedative, put them in the truck, and ship them over to the research center. And that animal has his life sacrificed. So what does that have to do with you? The moral of the story is, what's in your coconut? It could be a Snickers candy bar. It could be a cigarette or alcohol. There's a number of things that are out there that are addictive to our body, that you are struggling with freedom. It's just like that monkey putting his hand into the coconut, but then he can't get away, and it takes his life. But if he would simply let go of what's in the coconut, he could have freedom. And so for each one of us to really have freedom, we have to let go. But we can't do that on our own. So what we need is to let go, but yet hold on to God. And he will give you strength over whatever you have become addicted to. So I want you today to turn your hearts to the Lord and say, I would like to be free. Help me, Lord, to be willing to give up this substance and give me power to let go and have freedom in you. Thank you for listening today. I pray this was a blessing. 
and that you will have improved health every day of your life. Thank you.